Please know that some of the material in this program may include views or recommendations of third parties which do not necessarily reflect the views of Manatee Educational Television or indicate its commitment to a particular course of action. METV cannot be held liable for the accuracy of information that has been provided by third parties. Welcome to Legends of the Bar. There are 12 men being honored today. I would imagine if you're normal, each of you is asking the question, how do you get to be a legend of the bar? And I imagine some of you are probably wondering, with 12, how many bars did we have to call to get who the... <laughs> okay, that was the funny part, and it wasn't that good. All right. Attempt at cheap humor. It's the Manatee County Bar Association, of course. Uh, that seeks to honor 12 of its most experienced and its strongest members. The role of these 12, as you will see when they come up, or when they, when you, they're not come, they may stand, but when they're introduced and when they're talked about and when you read about them, the 12, um, their original role will be clear. They will be considered by you and are all of us as important lawyers, models for the young practitioner. But they're elevated today to an historical position if you put it in monetary terms, the bar is buying them lunch today. That's the only other thing I'm even going to try to be humorous about. Uh, the question I think for you is, did they arrive at this status voluntarily or were they, um, were they uh, um, surprisingly put here? And I think that what you'll see as we go through the process of talking about and remembering and seeing these folks, um, a couple of things. The first thing you're going to see is a 15-minute picture presentation of the 12 of them. I would like to say that uh, thank you to Gilbert Smith and his able assistant, Dinah Baker, and of course the folks at METV, especially Charles uh, Clapsaddle, who's done a marvelous job preparing this piece. And so if you'll kindly direct yourselves to that, let's do that.
pretty sure I've never seen a group of 12 people with cooler hats in their lives. <laughs> now you're about to hear a short, and when I say short, I mean short, presentation. It's unfortunate, but that's the way it is. On, t uh, on each, each presenter has promised, I'm looking at them now, has promised to stay at three minutes. And for any who go beyond, a gentle reminder from you, um, I guess chicken or pie, either one tossed up here correctly will remind them. I'll introduce the first presenter who will then introduce the next and so on until we get to the end. I'll do a brief closing, and so we'll move on. Um, Bill Lau, if I can introduce you first. There you are. I was really pleased when I was invited to talk about Frank Arpaia. Frank and I have been friends for at least 35 years. Ever since I came to Bradenton fresh out of law school and ready to apply all that legal knowledge to solving the problems of the world. I started as an assistant state attorney and one of the first courts I appeared in was the Justice of the Peace Court presided over by Frank Arpaia. It did not take me long to find out that the rule in Shelley's case was less important than the rule in Frank's case. <laughs> Frank, Frank taught me a lot, and a lot of other young lawyers, a lot about how the law really works. He knew the law, make no mistake about that. But he always seemed to reach a result that made common sense in addition to legal sense. He treated the criminal defendants and the civil litigants who appeared before him with respect and made them feel, irrespective of the outcome, that they'd been heard that they had had their day in court. Frank was born in 1931 in East Haven, Connecticut, and graduated high school there in 1948. He took his undergraduate degree at UConn in 1952, and from the film, it may have been he played basketball. After a stint with the Air Force during the Korean War, he graduated from the University of Florida Law School in 1958, and he's been practicing law here in Bradenton since that time. And if you look at that photograph on, up in the courthouse of Judge Hensley's robing, you'll see young, dashing Frank Arpaia looking on. Frank has had an interesting career of service to the community and to the law. During the same years, that he was Justice of the Peace. He was also the municipal judge of Longboat Key. He's been the president of this association, a member of the ABA, and is a past president of the Young Republican Club, the Bradenton Country Club, and a past officer of the DeSoto Celebration, the West Coast Symphony, and Delta Theta Phi Law Fraternity. As you can see, Frank was never one to ask for whom the bell tolls. He uh, went out and uh, took care of that. And our county is the better for Frank's being here. I litigated a number of cases against Frank over the years, and I found each to be a learning experience. Frank has an ability to, as we say nowadays, think outside the box. Just when I would think I had Frank where I wanted him, he would conduct a flank attack and blow my case away. One time I made what I thought was a great closing argument in a contested custody case. Frank had the mom as a client, and I had done a great job of proving that she had a bad habit of going out and getting really drunk, had cheated on my client, and was a spendthrift to boot. When I finished, Frank said, so what? <laughs> he went on to point out that she took good care of the children, saw that they were properly supervised when she went out socially. <laughs> Judge Smith looked at me and said, so what covers it? <laughs> He ruled for the mom, <laughs> and uh, I lost to Frank again. <laughs> he used the same common sense approach as a litigator that he did as a judge. 
Frank's contributions to our community and to our profession are well known. Equally known is the fact that Frank Arpe is a genuinely nice guy. Years ago, when I and a number of others in this room were young lawyers and were learning the ropes, Frank was one of the older lawyers that we could call on for advice on how to handle a problem. And talking to Frank always seemed to get the job done. A former president of the ABA once made the statement that lawyers are the best people in the world to work with, fight with, or play with. And Frank was a sociable guy as well. In the old days of this association, which at that time numbered maybe 50 or 60 lawyers, we would have a spring beach party. And once the steaks were consumed and the kegs started getting light in the water, it seems that certain members, possibly Warren Goodrich, Bob Knowles, Jack Manson, Bob Marshall, Gilbert Smith, and always Frank Arpea, would begin a game of skill involving the exchange of currency. <laughs> It was a contest that the prudent rookie would have been wise to observe rather than participate in. <laughs> but I was. Those parties and games and the warm friendships they nourished were good for our profession. And Frank was a major factor in those days of collegiality that unhappily are less frequently found. I give you Frank Arpea, my friend and colleague. Thank you, Frank, for your help and friendship. <laughs> Honorable Durand Adams. I've been given three minutes to describe a man who has practiced law at the highest levels for over 40 years who has had a most distinguished career on the bench, including retiring as the Chief Judge of the 2nd District Court of Appeal, and who has devoted a lifetime of service to his community and state. Fortunately, most of you are familiar with the details of his many accomplishments, so what I will offer is an Impressionist's portrait of John Blue. John Blue has always been a star. This was evident as early as high school, where he, along with his younger brother, Dick, led the Manatee High Hurricanes basketball team to glory. John was named a first team selection to the South Florida Conference All-Star team in 1952, and the Braden and Herald described in one story how, quote, lanky, wiry Johnny Bob Blue delivered the payoff punch <laughs> that brought the Hurricanes their fifth win in seven games, end quote. In another article, the newspaper, under a headline that read, Blue Brothers Spark Victory, reported that, quote, the Hurricane Blue Brothers broke loose in a brilliant shooting exhibition to snatch the game out of the fire. And he wasn't just a basketball star. To top it all off, he was voted cutest boy in the class of 1952. <laughs> now, he made me promise to get that in. I have always thought that one of the great things about being a lawyer is that it is a profession that gives ordinary men and women a real chance to become heroes. In one of the more notable civil trials of the 1980s in Manatee County, John took up the cause of a 19-year-old daughter and her two young brothers who filed a suit to block their stepmother from being awarded the proceeds from several insurance policies on their father's life. Their father died from four gunshot wounds he received in his home while apparently alone with his wife. The case was originally classified as a suicide. John Blue filed a civil lawsuit against the wife alleging that she was the one who had fired the gun. After the civil suit was filed, the wife was indicted for first degree murder. At the criminal trial, she was acquitted. Undeterred by that outcome, John and Caleb Grimes pressed on with a civil lawsuit and ultimately convinced 
a jury in a civil trial that the wife was responsible for the man's death and so she was prohibited from collecting under the insurance policies and the money went instead to the children. I spoke to the daughter recently and she said that it is rare that you can call someone you know a hero, but that that word applied to John Blue. She said the lawsuit was never about the money, but was always about justice. What John and Caleb did in their relentless pursuit of justice restored her faith in the legal system and, as it turned out, in some measure inspired her two brothers to become lawyers themselves. Lawyers can also be heroes outside of the courtroom by virtue of their position and community profile. John and his wife, Mary Ann, have spent their lives committed to certain ideals of equality and fair play. And when the controversies surrounding the issues of integration and busing arose in Manatee County in the early 70s, the Blues stood firmly on the side of what they felt was right, keeping their three young daughters in the public school system while others abandoned it for private schools. A biracial committee was formed with John and Mary Ann and others to help ease the transition from segregation to integration. Many in our black community remember to this day how John and Mary Ann Blue stepped up in difficult times to do the right thing. How important do you think it was to have a numinous voice like John Blue's on your side in a struggle like that? Because of his integrity, his intelligence, and his wisdom, people respect John Blue like few others. And as a result of that, a lot more weight is given to what is being said when John Blue is the one who is saying it. So, he has always been a star. Through his work inside and out of the courtroom, he became a hero. And now after today, he is officially a legend. <laughs> Not bad for a kid who a long time ago graced the sports pages of the Braden and Herald as Johnny Bob Blue, the young man with a one-handed push shot. <laughs> that kid grew up to be a man who has spent his life dedicated to making sure that everyone gets a fair break under the law. And as far as I'm concerned, he's as close to Atticus Finch as we may ever get. John Blue. <laughs> Now Chip Rice will speak. All the rest of the presenters are up here struggling to shorten their time so we get finished by one o'clock after our first two. Uh, <laughs> born Edward Nicholson Fay in 1931. An army brat, son of an army officer, and much traveled in his youth. Since then, a lawyer of 47 years and counting, a soldier himself, a public servant, a father of three sons who are with him today, and a churchman. Now, we at the bar cannot ask for much more and we of the bar ought not to ask of ourselves any less. Bill Fay began his labor in the law in Manatee County in 1957 upon graduation from the University of Florida College of Law, and he continues that practice today. Now, while at law school, Bill learned well the need for attention to detail as well as the art of common law pleading. Heretofore and hereafter, those of us who've had the occasion to practice with Bill know well that with confidence we can pass through the first 20 pages or so to the conclusion <laughs> with the certain knowledge that the conclusion will be solidly supported by what was aforesaid. <laughs> I first met Bill in 1982 at the old Woolworth 10 cent store 
was set where the county building now is, where a group of the old boys gathered largely from the courthouse and included Walter Talley, Judge Walter Talley, among others. And by that time, Bill Fay had been the Manatee County School Board lawyer and the Manatee County attorney, having had the distinction of being the last outhouse county attorney. <laughs> Bill became and still is the lawyer for the Manatee County Housing Finance Authority and importantly, the Manatee County Port Authority. By that time as well, he had served as president of the Braden and Rotary and importantly as president of this Bar Association. I've known Bill at our church as well. He has been a member of the vestry, which is the governing board of the Christ Episcopal Church, and a lay reader there, as you saw him uh, in photograph, enrobed in black. He can portray a formidable vision, uh, putting you in mind of a Charles Dickens character, <laughs> giving out the word of the Lord. Socially, Bill is a quiet man, but don't let that sometimes taciturn appearance deceive you. At Port Authority conventions, he has been seen teaching the Port Authority chair lady his version of the peppermint twist. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then competing with the then county attorney for the next dance. <laughs> Seriously, from personal experience, I can tell you that to be a public lawyer serving an elected body is no mean task. It requires legal knowledge and experience, but moreover, it requires perseverance, patience, diplomacy, and political savvy just to survive especially where the client's business is growing irrepressibly and geometrically like Port Manatee. Edward Nicholson, they call me Bill Fay, has demonstrated those qualities and skills for over 47 years and has become one of our Manatee legal legends, Bill Fay. Now my pleasure to introduce to you my friend, and he is my friend, Hugh McGuire. Thank you. I want to thank all of my predecessors for taking all of my time, and uh, it's a privilege to be here, Bill. Uh, it is a privilege to be able to stand here, uh, especially when I see these legends. It's a privilege, but yet it's a little scary because I've been partners with some of them, uh, practiced with all of them, and uh, I guess that tells us something, doesn't it, Bill? Uh, I'm not going to tell you when Bill Garland was born. You can look at the material. Uh, dates are no longer important, are they? No. Uh, <laughs> I will tell you that Bill was born in Orange, New Jersey. He graduated from Dartmouth. He clerked for the second district. And then when he came to Bradenton, after his clerkship, he joined the firm of Die Die. And in those days, you, I guess you either came to work for Die and Die or for Grimes, uh, one of the other firms. I met Bill in about 1971 when I started practicing. Didn't have a lot of cases with him because I spent the first seven years in the library with Bill Grimes. That's where we, we had to practice and had to start. But I did have, in those days, general cases, and all of us, I think, practiced a more general type of law. And the thing that always impressed me about Bill was that when you would walk up to him, and I don't care how bad the case was going to be, Bill would always walk up to you with a smile on his face and he'd stick out his hand and he'd shake hands with you. 
And as someone said earlier, when you're taught in law school, you learn certain things and you stereotype certain lawyers and how you should act, and Bill shattered those. And for a young lawyer, that was great experience, and I always appreciated that. And it was always a pleasure to see him. You can look at his biographical sketch, but there's certain things that I did want to point out to you. Bill has been a past president of this Bar Association. He was in the Conquistadors. He's in the Kiwanis. Bill is married to, uh, I had my note here and I went over there and met her a while ago, but <laughs> <laughs> he's married to the former Dottie Thompson. Dottie, I'm sorry. I went over and said hello. And he has three children and three grandchildren. And he is now with the firm of Garland, Paddleford, and Cackless, and they just moved into new quarters. The other thing that I want to say about Bill Garland is I never saw a time when he didn't look like he had just stepped out of Brooks Brothers. <laughs> the guy was always dressed fit to kill. And when I get through with all of this and I think back, I remember what an old contracts teacher taught me in my first year of law school. He had been the dean at the University of Georgia, and he was then teaching contracts at Mercer. And he said, when you get out of here, he said, you need to do one thing. You need to look like a lawyer and think like a lawyer, talk like a lawyer, and smell like a lawyer. Well, the last one I wasn't sure about. What he meant, you got to stay in the library long enough that you pick up the odor of the books. <laughs> And I'll say that I never got close enough to Bill Garland to see if he smelled like a lawyer. <laughs> but he sure acted like a lawyer, and he talked like a lawyer, and he thought like a lawyer. And it's been a pleasure to work with you, Bill. Congratulations. The legendary coach, Vince Lombardi, said that to win, you have to have the will to prepare. And that statement sums up Warren Goodrich as a trial lawyer. He was a tenacious, meticulous, and zealous advocate for his clients. He spent hours in preparation, starting with the pleadings and then through every stage through trial. Warren developed a sense of fearlessness and tenacity that he would bring with him as a trial lawyer from flying a small plane over the enemy as a forward observer for the artillery in the Second World War, even crash landing at one point. As a former editor of the Law Review, Warren was a consummate editor. There would be many drafts of everything he wrote. I believe if you gave him a grocery list, he would edit that. <laughs> As a new trial lawyer, Warren was astonished that many lawyers didn't know evidence. Before the evidence code, Warren would argue points of evidence, and he could quote extensively from memory Wigmore and evidence. But beyond the preparation and knowledge of evidence, Warren believed that trials were fluid processes and that a good trial lawyer did not stop thinking about the case once the trial began. He'd talk about the case all the time, from early morning to late at night, always analyzing what was going on. And he also believed that a good trial lawyer listened and that taking minimal notes allowed him to do that. Many times I would hear him say that he could best a detailed note taker because he believed that such a lawyer wasn't really paying full attention. Warren and his first cousin, Al Cohn, founded the Academy of the Florida Trial Lawyers with other trial lawyers, both being early presidents. The Academy was an outgrowth of the Association of Trial Lawyers of America and an association for lawyers who had an interest in trial work. Judges immediately favored this organization, and Warren and the other founders believed that such a group could provide mentoring and education for new lawyers who had natural skills but weren't as good because they didn't have courtroom experience. Warren says that he's proud of the small part he had in creating what has grown into one of the nation's best voluntary bar associations. As chairman of the Florida Democratic Party, Warren was privileged together with Governor Ferris Bryant to escort President Kennedy around Florida and to see him off to Texas just before that fateful day in Dallas. His firm's merger with Holland and Knight was a result of the big firm's desire to have a top litig litigator, and it paid off, dramatically so, especially when a problem developed with a case in Miami after jury selection, and with only about 24 hours to prepare, <coughs> Warren tried the case. 
Now you probably haven't seen the painting close enough on the um, uh, slides, but if you look at the painting that Jack Manson did, Warren is nattily dressed and with a folded magazine in his pocket titled Body Beautiful. <laughs> Warren was always particular about the way he looked and he kept himself and still does in good physical shape. But what many of you may not know is that Warren put a shower in the office. And during jury trials at noon, Warren would come back, take a shower and change his clothes completely. In fact, he would do this even when we went on the road to try cases, which created problems for those of us who were with him, particularly if you had to go as we had one case in Miami and had a convoy from the courthouse to the hotel and then back again all within an hour. Um, what I thought he was doing this for, and I still believe, was he was trying to rejuvenate himself for the afternoon session. I've begun to believe over the years that he was trying to get the jury's attention right after lunch and wake them up by them looking at him with different clothes on. When I talked to uh, Warren and his wife of 62 years, Althea, I asked Warren what he attributed his success to over the years. And he said, without hesitation, I owe it all to my wife, but she denies it. <laughs> and she replied without hesitation, he never would have gotten out of law school without my help. <laughs> I'm the only person who could read his notes. Uh, Warren and his partner Dick Hampton, who we also honor today, gave me my start as a lawyer and I thank them both. And I particularly thank Warren for teaching me how to try cases correctly and well. And it's my very deep personal pleasure to introduce Warren Goodrich. Thank you, Judge. Uh, most of you out here are lawyers, and as such, I know that you are familiar with the rule against perpetuities. Rule against perpetuities is one that limits certain uh, activities and things to a life and being plus 21 years. And I got to thinking about that and uh, realized that jurisprudence, you know, has dictated that 21 years is a long time for any one thing. And looking at Bill Grimes' law career and to put it in perspective, he has been practicing for three 21-year periods and very actively uh, practicing during those three 21-year periods. And that gave me, with three minutes, it gave me a uh, a little bit of a road map in which to take his career in those three 21 per year periods and tell you something about each of those periods uh, uh, to, to be able to get through this. His first career started in 1941. <clears throat> it was a time of coming to uh, back down to Bradenton from Tampa and building his law career, his reputation, and, and thankfully uh, his family. It was tougher than uh, the times today, and many, many a time I've heard him say that during that time period in his life, if somebody walked in the door, they had a lawyer representing them. And he did that. He was always that way to take care of anyone and that needed some help, whether they had some money or not, or whether they may have had a chicken to give him in, in his rep representation. But it was a time where he had a very active trial practice and when he also served uh, Manatee County in the uh, Florida House of Representatives, much like uh, one of his partners does today, Bill Galvano. But one of the things I wanted to say about during that time period that I know he's been very proud of was as a member of the House of Representatives, he was instrumental in seeing that Manatee County was deeded what has now become Coquina Beach. And we have Coquina Beach, and we are able to use that and all of the citizens because of his actions. And he was very instrumental to assure that in times of development pressures, that it was done in a way that it could never be sold and it could never be used for anything but for the public. We all enjoy that today. During his second 21-year career, it's a time of change in uh, Manatee County, his practice was to a great extent, condemnation law. He did represented a lot of people in, in helping them get their just uh, rewards from, from having to give up their land for the public good. Uh, he's very successful with the firm and it allowed him to become very active in the bar and the community. He was president of this bar. He was chairman of the uh, 
uh, Chamber of Commerce. He served uh, the bar here, Manti County Bar, on, as a Board of Governors, a representative on our, our Florida Board of Governors. And it was during this time period that he was selected uh, by Manatee County as the Manatee County Outstanding Citizen. And I think it was a recognition well deserved and his footprints are out in front of the courthouse today. His third career, I think, is exemplified by something that a lot of you members of the bar are aware of, and that was how, as he served as trustee of the Alma Meyer Trust that was for the benefit of the Boys Club. And he was the one that oversee, did the overseeing of the uh, Palmetto Pines golf course, pretty much ran it from his law office, and assured that millions of dollars went to the Boys Club, Palmetto Boys Club and the, and the rest of the Boys Club in Manatee County. Uh, this was a time, his, his third career, a time of what I would say quietly running things to assure that they were all very successful and meaningful and, and did the most for a lot of people, including the way he's run our law firm. One of the things that I think uh, my dad has always exemplified and instilled in others is one, one guiding principle, and I heard it mentioned a little bit earlier. He had an insistence on honesty and integrity. Uh, those of you that practiced with him will know that that, that was one of the uh, the guiding uh, principles for him and in his law practice, especially in dealing with fellow members of the Florida Bar, fellow members of the bench, uh, and it's something that I think all of us should never lose sight of. <clears throat> but the one thing I hope I personally got from, from Bill Grimes, I really hope I got his genes <laughs> because <laughs> I hope when I'm 86 and I'm as active and as healthy I don't particularly think I necessarily want to be practicing law, but, <laughs> but he, he enjoys it, and I certainly wish you luck in your next 21 years. <laughs> Bill Grimes. <laughs> this time, I, I'm thankful to bring in the Honorable Robert Boylston. I, I got to practice with him when I first started practicing, and he taught me a whole lot. So. Pleasure to have you. Although Dick Hampton is younger than I am, he was two years ahead of me in law school at the University of Florida. So I really didn't get to know Dick until after both of us had located to Bradenton. Some of you may not have known before we got here today that Dick served as county judge in Manatee County in the early 1960s. He was very well respected as a county judge here, but he selected to return to private practice and not seek a judicial career. So Dick joined Warren Goodrich to form the law firm of Goodrich and Hampton of which I was at the time an associate and later a partner. I had the privilege of working with Dick for about 12 years at Goodrich and Hampton. And I learned a great deal from him and I appreciate all that he taught me and all that I learned from him. During much of this time, Dick served as county attorney for Manatee County. This was an important time for our county. These were important years. Some of the significant projects that Dick worked on as county attorney were Port Manatee, the Manatee County Utilities System, the establishment of a countywide library system, and the adoption of our first pollution control ordinance. One of my early memories of being an associate of Dick's was a trip that we took to New York City for the purpose of attending a legal seminar. Actually, Warren was supposed to have been gone to that seminar, but something came up and he couldn't go, so he asked me to take his place. And I enjoyed the trip and I enjoyed being with Dick. 
But one thing about this trip, it tells you something about how long ago we're talking about because this trip was the first time I had ever flown on a jet airliner. At that time, the prop airliners were the rule of the day. And this was quite an experience in that regard, too. In 1976, Goodrich and Hampton merged with Holland and Knight, and Dick continued in the practice of law until his retirement in 1986. Did I, did I say 76 was when they merged, and he continued with them until 86. Dick was the kind of lawyer that you enjoyed working with steadfast in representing his client, yet always seeking to maintain a good relationship with other attorneys. He was respected both by his clients and by his fellow members of the bar. Dick has always been an avid supporter of the Florida Gators and has remained loyal through all the ups and downs of Gator football, a fisherman, a golfer. Both Dick and wife Kathy enjoy playing golf. Dick was the organizer and leader of a very popular weekly golf event at the Bradenton Country Club called the Dog Fight. And that tradition that he started still remains there today. It is my honor and privilege to introduce to you my friend and former law partner, Dick Hampton. Dick Hampton. When, when Sue called me and, and asked me to introduce Dad, she said, take two or three minutes. And I thought, you know, what I, what I say about a lifetime, what I pick out um, and use in two or three minutes. I've practiced law with him for 19 years, and um, there's just a whole lot to say. But um, I could talk for 20 or 30 minutes about a lot of these guys, Dick Hampton and Warren Goodrich, Roger Lutz over here. We were all uh, together for a while. Um, it's just a great bunch of people here. But uh, I, I suspect that um, over, whatever, 50-something years, most of you all have had occasion to, to do a deal with Dad, and I'm, I'm certain it was pleasurable. Um, I think what I'll do is just share with you how he, his unique way of, of working. Um, in, in our firm, uh, generally, well, all of us, meet with clients in conference rooms and you know we shut the door and and deal with their business well that's not how dad does it he brings them up into his office the doors he's got two doors and barber sits between them and and um, dad meets with these folks and and he and barber yell back and forth and he does the deal right there with them and they sit there and talk while she's doing whatever it is that it takes and he takes phone calls from other people and they all and generally they know each other and, and uh, just a, a, a different sort of way. And man, Lord help you if you walk past that door when he's sitting there with you. Hey, Joe, come on in here. You remember so and so? He's married to so and so's cousin. They live out somewhere. And I haven't got a clue generally who he's talking about. <laughs> uh, but you know, you sit there and you, oh yeah, good to see you again. It's been a while. But anyway, um, you excuse yourself and try to get on back to work. <laughs> And generally about this time, you're out to lunch with Dad, and he'll be saying something like, uh, hey, I got some little ladies I got to get back and see. We got we to hurry up and get out of here. So we go back, and sure enough, you know, you, you learn you want to go the back way because otherwise you'll walk through the lobby and you'll get it again. Hey, Joe, come here. You remember? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, we've, we've noticed uh, lately uh, a lot of his clients, these little old ladies, are uh, getting younger. <laughs> I was talking to Dad about it, and I think I figured it out why. It's most of his clients now generally have guardians or personal representatives. <laughs> but anyway, it's, it's, it is a, truly a blessing, and I'm, I'm sure Caleb, where we, 
would agree it is it's a wonderful experience to get to to practice law with your father and I introduce Papa before I mention Jack Manson who I'm here to talk about uh, there, there is something I would like to say. I, I didn't get a chance to practice with my father, but I feel like I came about as close as you possibly can. Because two of the legends here, uh, I really want to thank. It would be Warren and Richard. And I say that on behalf of my partners, Alan Bobo and Charlie Telfair, and a whole lot of former partners back there and everywhere and probably every place in Florida. Uh, you guys taught us how to be lawyers and how to practice law, and we're grateful. Thank you. Now about Jack Manson, our good friend. I, I haven't, I don't know where he is, but I think he's here somewhere. There he is. <laughs> I remember when Jack first came to my attention. The first time I heard his name, I was looking at that picture, the painting, <laughs> and uh, somebody said, "Hey, uh, a guy named Jack Manson painted it. He's a uh, a lawyer here in Manatee County." which I, it struck me as a little odd because in those days, lawyers practiced law, drank scotch, fished, and, and played golf. And a Renaissance man fished and played golf. So when I found out we had a painter, I, it was pretty strange. But then I figured out who Jack was, and then in the mornings when I'd be coming to work, I'd see him. And s s about every other morning, he'd be in this huge Rolls Royce. Then the next day he'd be on this beat up old girl's bicycle. <laughs> Remember? With a basket in the front and a bell. And I thought this is me now. <laughs> <laughs> I thought this is an odd guy. I wonder what's up with this guy. A Renaissance guy to the to the hilt maybe. So then I, I, I got in with, got lucky and got in with Richard and Warren and I was given the opportunity to work in the same building with Jack and I got to see him up close and personal. And he was even more strange and amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Jack appeared to thoroughly enjoy showing up at the office. When a client came in for a conference, I mean, you would have thought that Jack had been invited to Buckingham Palace. He was delighted. Jack thoroughly liked, or at least he, it appeared that he thoroughly liked his secretary, his receptionist, his CPA or the pension guy would call. He'd be happy about that. I couldn't understand it. Uh, he wasn't yelling at people. It was just an amazing way to practice. Uh, it dawned on me one day. I, I remembered the roles and then he, he lived over on the river. And I thought, well, this guy's making a fortune over there. Quietly, Brits Ray, that's why he's so happy. <laughs> uh, and then I thought, well, you know, with that kind of money, why doesn't he travel, get a big boat, maybe a plane? Hell, he could have started his own space program in those days. <laughs> but no, he stuck around. And, and then finally, it dawned on me that Jack was very happy being Jack. And Jack liked being a lawyer, he liked his clients, he provided a good and valuable service, and everybody liked Jack. Everybody I know liked Jack, and one of the reasons that is, is I'm sure he wasn't happy all the time, but he sure gave the impression that he was happy all the time. And if you're having a bad day, and you should get lucky to go to lunch with Jack Manson, or sit and talk to Jack Manson, I promise you'll feel better at the end of the day. Jack has that effect on people. Now, and unfortunately, we, uh, we have to go to funerals occasionally. First thing I do is look for Jack Manson because I want to sit next to him. Because <laughs> he makes you feel better. Now, Jack's uh, background and his CV or resume, it's, it's in your program and it's very impressive. He too was a former president of this organization. Um, He's a Wisconsin Badger. He was a Badger fan back when they were winning one game every other year. Um, but it is impressive and he's done a lot for the community and for the bar and for his clients and friends and family. But what's not in the resume 
is what a true gentleman, scholar, and just all around nice man Jack Manson is, and I'm glad I know him. <laughs> Next, a, a legend himself, Judge Hensley. Oh, there you are. <laughs> hey. I have a privilege of uh, introducing to you Bob Schultz. Bob uh, was born in Connecticut uh, in uh, 1929. His folks came to, to Bradenton in 1934 and uh, stayed here until uh, 1943 when they returned to Connecticut. Bob tells me his folks uh, lived in the old Hiscott property out on the corner of 43rd and Manatee, northwest uh, corner. And I think his father raised some gladiolas. He found out they didn't sell too good during the Depression. <laughs> Bob was uh, reared during the Depression to a large degree. He attended the University of Hartford and then Georgetown University Law School where he graduated in 1955. He moved to Bradenton or, and uh, went into uh, practice with Bob Marshall over in Palmetto in those days, uh, in 1955. Uh, he was only with Bob about six months. He didn't take up too many of Bob's habits in those days. Uh, <laughs> he didn't, uh, <laughs> didn't get too contaminated. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Took over. He did take over the practice from George Lee, though, and I don't know if any of you remember George Lee. Uh, he was quite a character in his own right, and uh, so he had the opportunity to take over that practice and continued with the bar at that time. He says he recalls when the bar met at Garcia's. How many of you remember Garcia's and the bar meeting there? We have a few people here. Uh, great time, young days of the bar. Uh, he says bar dues was thirty-five dollars a year. His memory is better than mine. Uh, <laughs> yeah, may have been fifteen. He said he, he put down here thirty-five. He, he just picked out a number, I think. I doubt, <laughs> I doubt if they were that high in those days, in the in the early fifties. Bob had a client who was uh, chairman of the Republican County Committee at the time that got Bob involved in Republican politics. And uh, his uh, local and state uh, uh, committeeman and became a focal point of his life for a period of time. His activities with the committee and he soon became active in the state young Republicans and served as state chairman in 1961. In 1960, Bob was elected to serve a four-year term as county prosecutor uh, and went into partnership with Ken Clary in 1961 through 1965, who was in uh, our county attorney, I believe. Uh, in 1967, he was appointed by Governor Kirk uh, as the judge of the court of record which was a court that was in effect for a short period of time before our new constitution took effect and abolished all the courts, uh, most of them, including the court of record, until he served, where he served in 1971. Upon retirement, he went back to, into private practice where he still practices today with his offices out on State Road 70 where he recently moved. He's married to Mary Frances Rector and has four children and seven grandchildren. I'll tell a short story on Bob. He tried a case before me one time. Insurance company had hired him to sue over an automobile wreck out on State Road 64 to recover the cost of the car. And there was an old gentleman who lived out there that had a ranch called Uncle Charlie Powell. Most everybody in the county knew Uncle Charlie because he could stand in his back door and yell and you could hear him to the, to the gulf. He had a big foghorn voice. Well, he sued Uncle Charlie for allowing one of his cows to run at large 
out on Highway 64, out just beyond the 18 mile post in the Bethany area. And Bob uh, <laughs> got to trying the case, and during the course of the trial, he had Charlie on the stand, and finally Charlie Powell looked at him and said, aren't you the little Bobby Schultz that I used to know around Bradenton? And uh, Bob had to acknowledge that he was. And uh, then as he was testifying, the jury became very amused. Everything was little Bobby this and Bobby that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this foghorn voice. And uh, finally, Uncle Charlie said something about this car was speeding. And Bob said, Uncle Charlie, you weren't out there. You were asleep. You don't know if it's speeding or not. He said, Bobby, he says, I may have been asleep. But says when he hit that cow, said he strung blood, guts, and hide now to 90 yards down that highway. And the jury liked to fell out of the box, and Bob, Bob's case went downhill from there. <laughs> but he never did sue Uncle Charlie Powell anymore. <laughs> Bob shoots. Thank you. It's a pleasure for me to be here back at the Manatee County Bar Association and see so many friends and to introduce my dad, uh, Jim Wallace. As most of you know, uh, I practiced law here in Bradenton for over 30 years. And as, as the years wore on and I got older, uh, people would say, Doug, when is your dad going to retire and let you take over his practice? And when they asked me that, I, I realized that they didn't know my dad nearly as well as I did, and I would say as a joke, well, you know, really, he's waiting for me to retire so he can take over my practice. <laughs> well, as it, as it turned out, the joke came true, <laughs> because I, I did retire from the practice of law, and my dad actually did take over a number of my files, uh, not all of them. Uh, Jim Wallace uh, came here to Bradenton in 1952. Uh, at that time, I think there were about 25 lawyers in town. He had the distinction at that time of being the first Republican lawyer and also the first lawyer who was a graduate of the University of Miami to practice in Bradenton, neither of which I, I think at that time was a great honor. Uh, he opened his office uh, across the street from the courthouse on Old Main Street. The office was at 530 12th Street West. Uh, it was upstairs. Uh, I think the last person to be up there was Chuck Chambers had a, his investigation office up there, although I, I think it's vacant now. Uh, but I remember that office, and I remember going down there as a boy, and looking back on it, I think the only things that uh, are still there now uh, in that area that were there then are the courthouse and the pool hall. Uh, 19 56, 1957, 1958, sometime around there, uh, my dad moved to his current location uh, uh, at uh, 420 Old Main Street, where he's continued to practice uh, ever since. Uh, in thinking about uh, my dad and his career uh, and, and in preparing to give this introduction, uh, three things uh, came to my mind that are significant about his career in the practice of the law. Uh, the first one that uh, comes to mind is his work ethic. Uh, as most of you probably know, my dad works every day. He still does. Uh, he works on the holidays when most people are not working. And that work ethic uh, has been important to me, and I think to some extent it's rubbed off on me and has served me in good stead. The second thing uh, about my dad is his, his independence. Uh, he's been a very independent guy, and he has enjoyed very much the independence that the practice of law uh, has given him. And I, I think that's one of the reasons that a lot of us go into law practice is we are able to maintain a measure of independence. And the third thing, and I think the most important one, uh, and the thing which has probably enabled him to continue to practice law for so many years is the fact that he absolutely loves what he does. He enjoys the cases, he enjoys the closings, he enjoys the clients, he 
He loves the people that work for him, and he has a great time practicing law. Looks forward to going into the office every day, uh, and that's been uh, one of the main reasons, I think, for his success and his longevity. And Dad, I, I wish you many more years of success and happiness in the practice of law. And now I introduce Bob Blaylock. Thank you, Doug. But before I uh, talk about my friend Ed Wisnett, I want to show Exhibit A, which is, this, this is Michelangelo Manson's masterpiece. For those of you that di haven't seen it before, or didn't, if you want to see what these gentlemen looked like in the earlier years, I'm going to leave this copy up here to see, because it, it is a great thing that Jack has uh, created for posterity of this Bar Association. I first met Ed Wisnett in 1944, when I was six years old. And, and, and Ed uh, uh, was here visiting his good friend, Brud Chilson, who happened to live next door to the house in which I lived. And Ed and Brud uh, subsequently both became colonels. At that time, they were probably second lieutenants or something like that. But uh, they were here visiting heroes home from the war. And uh, I was a very impressionable uh, young man as I am today. Uh, <laughs> And uh, Ed and I uh, developed a friendship as I did with Brud, but I didn't see Ed again until 1962 when I was at Gainesville in law school. And all of a sudden there was Ed Wisnett, having had a successful career, by now as I say a colonel, having uh, retired from the Army. And there was Ed, and I said, Ed, what are you doing here? He says, well, you know, I've decided I want to be a lawyer. At that time, I don't think he had any idea he was going to come back to Bradenton. So uh, Ed and I both struggled through law school and, uh, and uh, graduated, and then he came back and uh, worked with uh, Stu Landers, who was subsequently my partner at the old Ellis First National Bank as a, as a trust officer, and after uh, having served there for a number of years, decided he wanted to go into private practice where he has had a very successful practice centering primarily in real property, probate, uh, and uh, office type practice. But uh, Ed is a, is a wonderful practitioner. His practice is known uh, primarily for its uh, uh, integrity and its honesty. But there's another factor that I'd like to throw into that about Ed, and I think that any successful attorney needs to have a little humor in his or her life. And uh, as I said, that, that uh, Wiz came here, as, as we refer to him, in, uh, uh, in the service, and he and Brud remained lifelong friends. Why, I'm not sure. For, for, <laughs> from either standpoint, because they could get the biggest mads on of, of anybody that I've ever seen. But they were lifelong friends. And uh, Whiz told a story about, uh, or I'm not sure whether Whiz or Brud, because I was friends with both of them, sometimes a mediator. Uh, but uh, Whiz told the story about uh, after they had both gotten married uh, after the war, and they were in their 30s. Uh, Brud married a gal named Maxine, and Faye, who is his wife, that we'll introduce in a minute, was here. And uh, Maxine, after they had been married for a year or so, opened Brud's army footlocker. And here was this wonderful collection of pictures. Now, I won't categorize these pictures <laughs> other than to say a former Supreme Court justice says, I know it when I see it. <laughs> Ma Maxine was shot. Uh, of course, Brud did the uh, uh, the brave thing, and he said they were whizzes, and he was <laughs> and 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 he and he was storing them for him. So uh, about a year later, the Whiznets and the Chilsons were visiting one another, and uh, Maxine confronted Whiz with this and wanted to know was this true? Were, were these really her husbands? Uh, are whizzes, and he said yes, and, and those that, ma that uh, Faye found in my footlocker were bruds. <laughs> now, unfortunately, Whiz is in a hospital and can't be here with us today. He has an infection. 
Uh, Faye assures me that he's getting better, but uh, Faye Wisnett is here with us today, and Wiz's daughter Sarah Head is here with us today. So I give you <laughs> Sarah and Faye. Wonderful. Uh, summation. How do you summarize? Uh, I've been working on it for three months. I should come up with a minute and a half of summarization. I think we can do that. Everybody, I think you've heard, was respected and honored. Everybody was experienced. There's no surprise there. Each had moments of wisdom. That may have surprised some of you. <laughs> they all had attractive skills. And as a younger, and those of us who are now advanced middle age and were younger when these guys were in this thing, um, we know that this is true. They, were, uh, they had advanced skills. They had attractive skills. We watched them and said, if I could only do that. And all of them were active in this, at that time, little bitty bar association that was starting to blossom. They were funny. Some of them. Some of them were funny, some of them were wise. They were all doing both, but some better than the other. They were active entertainers, a few of them. Uh, you've heard that they all, well, what you haven't heard perhaps, but that you should know is that they all regularly lunched with, stopped in the hall and talked to, met at the Bar Associati Association meeting with the young and the, and the unexpected and the uh, inexperienced and were kind of unofficial tutors to the rest of us who were joining the bar and trying to learn how you really practice law, not the law school stuff, how you really do it. And so these 12, believe it or not, were the tutors. They told stories, some of which I remember very clearly and some of which I've forgotten. They shared moments that touched on themselves, all those were remembered. They shared moments that touched on each other. You all told stories about each other. The funniest ones were the stories they told about public officials who had once held office and sometimes at that time held office. Those were quiet, funny stories on the side. They, uh, there is no better group, I think, from which the new practitioner could pick up insight, critical insight, could pick up, pick up some vision of where we go and how it ought to look, and pick up some practical bits of, I guess, legal treasure to make our practices more meaningful and more significant. But here's the main point. Here's the main point. They're all legends because neither in their practice, neither in their lives, their association with fellow lawyers, did they teach or live the values which I think the public out there frequently believes we really accept and pursue. I think the public thinks that sometimes we stand for craftiness and sometimes we promote sly negotiation and innuendo. I think sometimes they think that we admire uh, the slick, the hardworking, but the greedy and the glorious. This was not what they did at all. These men talked and they lived and they showed and they worked the values that we truly do appreciate. And you've heard them all here. Fairness and competence, those are easy ones to see. Respect, that's an easy one too. Community service, community commitment, and probably the most important, we all got from them the sense of honor of the practice of law is much more important than winning this case or that case. So they really are legends.